Good day, race fans! I'm on silent and we're on the air with more Grand Prix 2. We've reached the penultimate round of our sim of the 1994 Formula 1 World Championship. The last round but one, as Murray Walker would say, it's the Japanese Grand Prix. From the Suzuka circuit in Japan, our second trip to Japan of the 94 season, the first one was in the second round. And we come back for the second to last round, this time at Suzuka. Of course, if you take a look at that little track map there, well, that looks kind of familiar. That's because it's pretty much the same circuit then as it is now. So we are going to be doing the uh, track comparison, except I'll tell you right now, if you take a look at 130Rs profile a little differently then and now, I think it was a little sharper back then and now. It's a little wider, a little more open, so that way you get a little more speed through there. And along with the final chicane, the Casio Triangle, as it's formally known, it uh, was uh, one. Of, it was uh, opened up a little bit to make it faster in the modern iteration. They straightened out the S curves, not things you can tell really well between you know a then and now comparison, but largely the same, of course. You know, if you want to look for big differences, they don't have wet weather racing in Grand Prix 2, where it was an absolute monsoon, the actual 94 Japanese Grand Prix, the last race run on aggregate time. So your time for the two from start to the red flag and the restart to the checkered flag, who had the fastest time they won, that was Damon Hill. Speaking of Damon, he's third in the world driver standings. Here it is after 14 of 16 rounds. Coulthard's already won the title, we've mentioned that. Schumacher. In P2, four points ahead of Damon Hill in position number three. Jean Lacey and I, I'm Eddie Irvine. We're tied on P4, but Lacey's got two wins to my one. So countback favors the Ferrari driver. And then the next best battle for seventh, Katayama and Hakkinen, both level on nine points. And as you'll see on the World Constructors Championship, same there. Katayama's Tyrrell team and the McLaren team for Hakkinen both on nine points. Tyrrell and Katayama head on count back in the second race of the season at uh, the Tanaka International Circuit Ada. They scored second place, so they're ahead on count back. And looking up at near the top of the standings just very quickly, Ferrari nine points ahead of Benetton. We're five points ahead of my team, Jordan. Williams has clinched the World Constructors Championship as well. So some battles to look forward to, but uh, mostly uh, mostly in this 5-6 uh, range. That's where the real battle's happening. On to Friday qualifying. Let's get straight into the action. Here's my first flying lap. Okay, here we go to the line. 142-6. Only good enough for P3. I had let quite a few cars go out before I had taken my first qualifying run. So normally, you know, I'm, you know, first one out so I get the fastest time early so P3 wasn't as bad as it initially looks because you look here well I'm just behind the two Ferraris and Schumacher ahead of Katayama so I'm probably looking at you know like a 7 8 9 like a high very good starting position here but of course I'm not quite going to settle for that for long as we take a look at my second lap we're going through the first sector, three tenths up on my first flying lap. As we go through this Degner's through Spoon, try and hold it in, clip the curb as we go through there, and we found a second and a half, 1.8 up on my first flying lap. As we follow me through the final sector, through 130R, get off the gas here because you can't hold it flat through there in these cars. Down to the Casio Triangle and we've run into traffic. That is one of the Pacifics ahead of us. Not that it's particularly good at this sector of the track, but we charge up to the line. It's a 41-1. We've lost four tenths in that last sector, and it's only good for position three again. Not spectacular, but uh, an improvement on what it was before as we go and take a look at the qualifying results from Friday qualifying. It's David Coulthard on the provisional pole, shocker but only 44 thousandths of a second behind him. It's Michael Schumacher in the Benetton Ford. As Eddie Irvine, I'm less than three tenths off the provisional pole, so not too bad, and it's a little gap back to the Ferrari of Jean Lacy. Damon Hill behind that. It's that battle for second. Schumacher, Irvine, Lacy, Hill, all right there. And a little farther back to Gerhard Berger. Ugyo Kadiyama, we know he needs a point to try and get a gap for seventh in the world driver standings ahead of Hakkinen. 
Well, he's uh, in seventh, so good position. Where's Hacken in there? He is P28. Did not set a time in Friday qualifying. So he is going to have it all to do on Saturday. And because of countback, he needs to finish ahead of Katayama on points. McLaren has to finish ahead of Tyrrell on points. So he needs a good qualifying result to score some points and pull them ahead of Tyrrell. On to Saturday qualifying. Here's my first lap. Use every inch of real estate outside the Casio Triangle. A little too much there. And we score a 41-3 on my first qualifying lap, which sounds good on paper, except for the fact that um, that's actually slower than my Friday time, so it does not help me in the slightest. So on to my second lap in qualifying through sector two through the spoon curve. Oh, too much curve. He tried to push it a little too hard. Coming out of spoon and onto the back straight to try and get a good lap time. But, uh, yeah, spinning is not a good trick, Anakin. So, that's uh, a lap aborted. On to the third qualifying lap. Let's take you the whole way around. Just get out ahead. I think that was a Williams that I just ducked out ahead of there. I think that might have been Hill. As we... By the way, I'm in P2. As we go through the S's here, it was, of course, Coulthard, who had a better time than me on the Saturday session, of course. As we come through... This long, I think it's a Dunlop curve, but it's a long nameless left-hander if you were to ask me as we come down to the Degners. Just breathe the throttle through Degner 1. Get on the brakes through Degner 2 as we're 6 tenths up. Use all the curve on the outside into the hairpin. Slow down 50 miles an hour. Not the slowest turn on the track the way I take it as we make the charge the long right-hander up to Spoon. There's a chicane off to the left. Off to the right, rather, if you're taking it on the motorcycle circuit. But now down through the second spoon curve. Very careful, because it's very easy to get on the throttle early and hit the gravel. Like I kind of did on the last lap. So we charge on up to 130R. You can't take it flat in a 94F on car. Just breathe enough throughout to lose a gear. Charge up to the Casio Triangle. On the brakes as you get under the bridge. The right, the left. Back to the right as we charge down the hill. At the line, what's it gonna be? It's a 140.1. I found a whole second in that last sector. I'm really bad at the Casio Triangle, except on this one lap. And that puts me on the pole for the Japanese Grand Prix at the Suzuka Circuit. 13 laps, one quarter race distance. I'm on pole as Eddie Irvine, almost eight tenths of a second ahead of David Coulthard. Michael Schumacher on the inside of row two alongside Jean Alessi. It's that battle for second in the world driver standings. Who else is in that battle? Damon Hill. There he is. Position number five. Mick Hakkinen only had to get one good qualifying lap in and by God to put him up into sixth. Sixth is a good for one world championship point. Behind him, it's Gerhard Berger and Hacking his championship rival, Ukio Katayama, right behind him, lining up at eighth. Rubens Barrichello didn't do too well at Jerez, but uh, P9 here, Johnny Morbidelli, car number 10 and P number 10, I love saying that. Johnny Herbert, P11, and Pierluigi Martini, P12. Andrea de Cesar is in the first of the Sauber Mercedes on row number seven, alongside Olivier Panis and Ligier Renault. That Ligier has come to life in the second half of the season. Michele Alvaretto in the minority Ford, and alongside him, Schumacher's teammate is Jos Verstappen in P16. Eric Coman, the LaRousse Ford, Mark Blundell in the second of the Tyrrells on row nine. Martin Brundle, Hackenden's teammate, all the way back in row ten alongside Cesaris's teammate, Heinz Harold Frenson in the second of the Sabres. Car 30 and P20. Doesn't quite have the same ring, does it? Eric Bernard in the second of Ligier Renault's on row 11. Christian Fotopaldi in the second footwork Ford in P22. Then row 12, it's Alex Zanardi in the Lotus Mugen Honda. A teammate to 11th place, Johnny Herbert and Olivier Beretta. Rounding out row number 12 on the outside there. And on to row 13, last row, it's David Brabham in the Simtech Ford. And Jean-Paul Belmondo, shotgun on the field in position number 26. The warning horn goes, the engines come to life, it's race time in Grand Prix 2 for Red Lights 
The refs come up. We bring the noise. Green, green, green for the Japanese Grand Prix. And I'm sandwiched. It's Schumacher on the left. It's a Lacey on the right. And I'm going spinning into the gravel in turn one. Let's take a look at the replay real fast. There, you can kind of see me behind Schumacher. And then, oh, it's Hakkinen. Hakkinen in the Renault. I thought at first it was going to be Coulthard. Just completely unseen. I left about a quarter of a car width on my inside. Apparently, that was an invitation from on board Hakkinen from his spectacular start from sixth. Dives up the inside of DC and just punts me out of the way. He used me as a brake to get through turn one. And from there, I'm just plummeting back uh, quite obviously as the only one really affected in the turn one dust up. I'm back to 26th and last. Does not take me long with the field bunched up and me with clear track. Does not take long for me to move up. Oh, uh, sorry, jumped the gun. I was going to gave away a spoiler for the next bit. It's Johnny Herbert. Johnny had the best start of it all. From P11 to P6, I tell you, Johnny's dangerous when he gets a good qualifying spot. You guys should believe me. Now, here's the spoiler I was giving you earlier. Up behind, grab him in the SimTech, give him a little chrome horn, a little Paul Tracy out of the way. Meanwhile, up front, there's David Coulthard, who fell back from P2 to P4, going up the inside of Hakkinen to 130R. Damon Hill looking outside, inside into the Casio Triangle, but he cannot make any of that. Meanwhile, back there on lap two, locked a little bit by Frenson through Degner, uh, trying to make a big move on Beretta through the Degners. Here we go, charging up to the hairpin, up the inside of the Sauber Frenson for position number 22. Now, I thought it went clean, but the replay showed me that Frenson turned down in on me and punted me in the side pod. Again, another look, turns down in on me. I did not feel that from the uh, live action, but it showed on the replay. Meanwhile, speaking of replays, here's a replay of Coulthard going up into P2 ahead of Jean Lacy. Again, same move as he did on Hackenden to 130R. And, oh, well, it was good while it lasted, wasn't it, Johnny? Johnny from 6th to 7th as the higher-powered uh, Gerhard Berger in the Ferrari goes by him for P6. A little later on, here I am, and oh, I'm I'm driving into a smoke screen. A fog bank as Johnny Morbidelli's footwork forward lets go in front of me, and he's just driving on the racing line. As we're going through the S's, I can't go anywhere. And then all of a sudden, through this last right, oh, his engine almost gives up, but as we come back through the left, his car does not accelerate at all, and boop, into the back of him. As just as he pulls off to the side, and I lose the position to Mark Blundell in the Tyrrell. But coming out of the hairpin, I get a good run and a little bit of toe as I go by him on that long right straight. Well, it's not straight, it's long right towards the spoon curve. Lap seven, it's Eric Bernard up the inside into the hairpin. Let's take a look at that one again. Unlike the Frenchman one, I didn't keep a pin to the inside. I just let it run wide and cut him off. Don't let him have any room. Lap number nine. Oh, there's the yellow flags through the S's. This is going to be a free position, but it's a free position for McLaren. It's Hackenden. Hackenden's gone off in the S's from position four. He's lost all sorts of positions. I could not find what happened to Hackenden, except only to assume that he got punted. Maybe by uh, Damon Hill, maybe by Jean Lacey. I'm not sure, but somebody got a hold of him. There I go by Eric Coma in the LaRousse into 130R. Didn't get a good run out of it, so Coma took a little look up the inside, but I managed to hold on to P13. Lap 10 back through the Casio Triangle. We're catching up on this gaggle of cars, and oops, no we aren't. A little quarter spin there as I get it all sorts of wrong through the Casio Triangle. And it took a whole two laps to catch back up to the Cesaris in the Sauber on the final lap we go up the inside of him into the hairpin and just shove him wide last lap no one cares I'm not worried about a penalty at this point we're going up to Spoon Schumacher's already won the race as we look up here's Pierre Luigi Martini we're looking all over the back of him into the Spoon curve I practically a part of his diffuser as we charge down the straight Get him out of Spoon, Substream, OP, and all that stuff you're used to be saying as I pull back into the racing line. How fast can I go through 130R about that fast on 13 lap old tires? So I'm not going to be able to get a dive in on Jasper Stappen 
for P10, so sadly, it's P11 for me in this Japanese Grand Prix and across the line to take P11. Not, man, that could have been a good race. I had a good car. I burned it all up trying to get through that field, though. That first lap incident really took me out of this one. That was for damned sure. As we go to the race results, after 13 laps in Suzuka, Michael Schumacher wins his second Grand Prix of the season. 1.6 seconds ahead of world champion David Coulthard. Damon Hill in P3, Jean Lacy in position number 4, Gerhard Berger holds on to 5th, and Rubens Barrichello made his way up to 6th. Poor Johnny, even when Hakkinen gifted him that position, couldn't hold on to it. Rubens in the Jordan, much better outing this time than he had last time out at Jerez. And then you go back on down through the standings. Panis Katayama couldn't capitalize on Hakkinen's misfortune. Verstappen with a top 10. And I just miss out on the top 10. In P11 or there, and on the second page, Hakkinen did finish 20th, but man, that spin really hurt him. Morbidelli had a water leak which killed his engine, and David Brabham retired on the third lap of the race. He had an electrical failure that took him out of the running quite quickly. On to the world driver's standings. Yeah, the top has a change. Schumacher has clinched second place. He has two wins to Hill's none, so he wins on count back, so he's second. It's a battle for third. Hill's only seven points ahead of Lacey and ten points ahead of me. Mathematically, I'm still in it for third. Meanwhile, if we go down the standings, Kadiam and Hacken still level on points at nine apiece. So that will go down to the final race. Hakkinen has to score one more point than Katayama in order to score uh, seventh in the World Drivers' Championship. On to the World Constructors' Championship. Basically the same score there. Benetton's close up to within four points of Ferrari. So Schumacher, another win. That could definitely get him into the uh, World Driver to Benetton, the second in the World Constructors. I'm sorry. And then, yeah, it looks pretty well done for us at Jordan. So it looks like it's a battle for two and three, and then five and six as well between McLaren and Terrell. Again, same rules apply here as the Hakkinen and Katayam battle. The last round of the 1994 Formula One World Championship is the Australian Grand Prix. Before it was the first race of the season, it was the last race of the season. And on the streets of Adelaide. And now they still race this for the Australian V8 Supercar Series. But here it was an F1 race as well. Of course, the neat little thing about this uh, track is that much like the Albert Park circuit in Melbourne, this is street circuit that is built into a park in Adelaide. So uh, you do have a bunch of right-handed turns because of city streets. It's not quite as fun as Albert Park, but boy howdy does it have a great passing zone at the end of the back straight. That uh, little right-hand kink at the top of the screen, that is basically flat in a V8 supercar and definitely flat in an F1 car. And imagine that down to the hairpin. There's going to be some great passing down at that hairpin. I am looking forward to this one. Not that familiar with the track. I drove it in uh, Toka Race Driver 3, but haven't driven it since, so I'm looking forward to getting reacquainted with the Adelaide Circuit, but that's not until next time on Grand Prix 2. So until the next time, I'm Unsilent. Thanks very much for joining me. Like the video if you liked it. Subscribe if you're new. Share on social media. Follow on social media. The social media handle is Unsilent on Air. That is for Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr. And until the next time, I'm Unsilent. Thanks very much for joining me. Like, share, subscribe, and we will see you next time. <laughs>